My name is Sunita and I am the verbal head at GMAT Pills. I have been in this prep industry for almost a decade now. And through these years, I have prepped over 30,000 students in various exams. Um, and that itself should speak about uh, teaching being my passion. It is a passion, actually. Um, I love helping students. I love interacting with them, uh, which is why I'm in this business for so long. Um, today, uh, I'm going to take you through a journey, uh, which most of the time students, uh, you know, this is a journey where students falter a lot. Um, they face problems. And today we're going to talk about that. So let me hear from you guys. Let's see. Hi, Abdul. Hi, Shaima. Hi, Naren. It would be lovely if I, there are a lot more of you there. So it would be very nice if I could get a nice warm hello from you. I would know who I am addressing. And we are going to have a lot of fun today. When I say fun, uh, I really want it to be fun along with a lot of learning. Hi, Vijay. Um, and we are going to discuss one of the most crucial issues today. And that is um, free thinking. All right. What to do if you cannot pre-think? Is there something that you can do if you cannot pre-think? Hi, Radha Krishnan. Nice to see you again. Hi, Nimesh. Nirmesh, sorry. Um, so, um, okay, yes, this webinar is usually not included in the verbal course. All right. Uh, lots of parts of the course are already there, but this is not there in the course to answer a question one of you has put. Hi, Julia. Nice to see you back again. And today we are going to do CR. Hi, Govindam. Hello, Kelsey. Hello, Prakhar. So very nice to see uh, all of you back again. Hi, Rajat. Hi, Vinay. Wow, that's a lovely audience. And I think by the name, I can understand that you guys are from all across the place. So Kelsey is with the, from Atlanta. Wow, very nice. All right, guys. So today I want you to be a very interactive audience. Hi, John. Uh, where you put forward your problems, the problems that you face, and I put forward solutions which can help you in your preparation. So a very quick, uh, a very, very short, brief, quick uh, intro about GMAT Wiz to those of you who are unaware. Hi, Priyank. GMAT Wiz is truly the world's only personalized uh, GMAT online prep course, All right, We provide you along with our AI-driven platform, we provide you a lot of um, a human intervention in the, in the form of mentors, dedicated mentors who are going to really look at each of you individually. Hi, Rajdeep. Nice. Okay, guys. So let's now, the, this session is on what to do if we cannot pre-think in CR, right? So before we move on to what to do uh, uh, because we can't pre-think or because we don't know how to pre-think is to first understand what this pre-thinking thing is all about, all right? And then I'm going to slowly lead you to that place where we're going to talk about what to do if I cannot pre-think, if, if he cannot pre-think, what to do, all right? So let me lead you up to that slowly but steadily, okay? Now, what is pre-thinking? The, the usual answers that I get is pre-thinking is like, you know, kind of predicting exactly what the answer is going to be, all right? This is what usually students think somehow in their minds. Well, is it really possible to think of the exact strainer that too during the exam, that too within a span of two minutes? No. So definitely pre-thinking is not predicting the exact answer. You know, that's a very uh, distorted understanding of what pre-thinking is. And often because people think that pre-thinking means predicting the exact answer, they are not able to pre-think correctly. All right. That is one of the basic psychological reasons. Uh, and that is because you don't really understand what pre-thinking is. All right. So this is the wrong understanding of pre-thinking. Then the question that comes up is, what is the right uh, answer to this question? What is pre-thinking? All right. So pre-thinking is basically coming up with a, let me use the word, shadow answer, even before you look at the answer choices. You know, you read the stimulus and you come up with a shadow answer. When I say a shadow answer, uh, it means that you come up with the outline of a possible answer. Okay. And this, okay, usually people think that pre-thinking uh, kind of, uh, it's a separate, uh, you know, have to, you have to assign a separate time. You finish reading the stimulus quickly and then you should sit and pre-think. No, that is not what pre-thinking is about. How are you going to come up with the shadow answer? Um, you know, so the, the process actually starts while you are analyzing the stimulus. Okay. And very few people understand this. 
that pre-thinking is in you know essentially uh, a part and parcel of the stimulus analysis today i'm going to show you that so hold on to that thought please guys that's the most important part of this webinar okay so pre-thinking starts while you are reading the stimulus itself okay at that point of time you're trying to see what information is given and simultaneously what is not given all right say for example if it is given to us what happens during the rainy season automatically you should think what happens when it is not raining all right is it given there or not given there like that for example all right so it's a lot it's a lot li like reading between the lines when you're reading the lines all right and then you proceed to uh, uh, coming up with a possible scenario you know usually when you're reading the stimulus a vague idea kind of forms in your mind and pre-thinking is just elaborating on that idea but we still have the we still have to answer what to do when we cannot pre-think so we'll come to that i'm just leading up to that all right so this is what pre-thinking really is all right now the question what is so difficult about pre-thinking like why can't we pre-think what stops us from pre-thinking in the right direction? You know, I've come up with students. In fact, I'll ask all of you. Give me a moment. Okay, I'm just going to bring up a poll in the moment. Just hear the question. How many of y'all have experienced this? Like you started pre-thinking. I mean, you, you read the stimulus and you try to pre-think and you came up with, let's say, an assumption. And then when you went to the answer choice, none of the choices matched your assumption and you were totally floored and you kind of marked the wrong answer because you did not know whether you were pre-thinking properly or not. How many of y'all exp have experienced this? Let me put up a poll for this. Yes. How many of y'all have experienced this kind of confusion? You took the time out to pre-think. You did come up with an assumption if it was an assumption question. And when you went through the answer choices, you found nothing matched. And then you, in, a, in, in your panic, you just, you know, chose any one choice. Oh my God, it's happened with almost all of you. It, it happened with me as well. When I was training for CR a long time back, sometimes I used to face the same problem. And when I used to face that problem, I used to wonder, where did I go wrong? What did I do wrong? Why couldn't I pre-think? You know, when you go through the solutions um, the prep industries provide, you think, oh my God, this was there. Why couldn't I think like this? All right. So that's the point. Why are students not able to pre-think? Let's talk about this. This is a very, very important part, guys. Please listen carefully. Um, a lot of you might be just that one step away from pre-thinking properly or one step away from solving your answers with accuracy, even without pre-thinking. So let's quickly understand why we are not able to pre-think properly. All right. So here's why. 99% of the time in my experience of teaching, I found that a student was not able to pre-think clearly because the student had no, I mean, the student did not have a crystal clear idea of the stimulus. You know, you do not have a clear understanding of the stimulus. You're not able to wrap your head around the scenario presented in the stimulus. You're not very, you know, clear about the conclusion. And that is the problem. That's the crux of the problem. Now, you might tell me, ma'am, I, I, I know which is the conclusion. I know this sentence is the conclusion. There is a conclusion marker here. And I know this conclusion is saying this. Well, my dear friends, oftentimes what appears on the surface is not the full depth. And because you're unable to spot that depth, you're not able to uh, swim well. Let me put it this way unless and until you are able to gauge the depth depth of something you won't be able to swim properly all right anyways and to, i'm not going to go too much into metaphors and stuff like that bottom line is uh, you cannot pre-think properly if you don't even know what you're supposed to pre-think and that is happening because you're, you haven't understood the stimulus correctly so the next question is why are you not able to understand the stimulus properly i mean it's there it's english it's english language you're reading the sentences there are just three four sentences what's so difficult about it well Here's the thing. And again, guys, I'm going to ask uh, whether you have experienced this uh, after I explain this. So tell me, just bear in mind what I'm going to ask you. Most of the time, because you can kind of literally see the clock ticking, okay? Because you know, oh my God, 36 questions, 65 minutes, all right? So 700 plus score, um, accuracy, um, you know, uh, adaptive test, 
negative marking, blah, blah. And what you do in that is you quickly read the passage. You gloss over the passage, okay? Some 30 word long sentence you expect to understand fully in under five seconds. I don't know how, five seconds, 10 seconds. So you read the entire sentence in one shot, all right? What happens actually is, and correct me if I'm wrong, okay? Think to yourself. What happens really is you do understand some parts of that sentence, but you do not have much clarity about some of the other parts. What do you do at this stage? Do you stop and tell yourself, let me understand this part before I move on? No, you tell yourself this. I will get back to this passage, to this portion of the passage for clarity later when I'm going through the answer choice. Okay, you tell yourself this. And this is the first mistake you make. And then what happens is actually when you go through the answer choices, you're so much under the time crunch that you really do not go back to the exact part of the passage. Or even if you go back, you're not able to dwell much on it. All right. This is what happens. Okay. Tell me how many of y'all have faced this? Wait, let me reset the poll. How many of y'all have faced this? Hi, Peter. Hi, Nitin. Yes, Vijay. So let me see. None of you have faced this. None of you have faced this problem where you quickly read the passage. You did understand some parts and then you went ahead and then you realized, oh my God, I didn't understand some part. Yes, over 95% of you have felt this some point or the other. So you see, this happens, okay? So the, we, are, we are getting to the, to the root of the problem. You haven't understood the stimulus, therefore you haven't understood the conclusion, therefore you cannot pre-think, you cannot pre-think, and then everything else is history. So we'll come, we'll, we, we are trying to, we are going to reach that. So the fallouts of not analyzing the stimulus is you're not able to correctly and precisely identify the conclusion, you know, precisely identify the conclusion. In most of the questions, over 50% of the questions uh, want you to do something or the other with the conclusions, isn't it? You have to identify the assumption or weaken the conclusion or strengthen the conclusion or evaluate the conclusion. How are you going to do this correctly if you don't even know the exact uh, meaning of that conclusion, okay? And for difficult questions, it is really difficult. We are going to discuss that today in the questions that we uh, solve. So because you're not able to uh, identify the conclusion, all right, in the stimulus, uh, because you haven't understood the stimulus well, you're also not able to understand the role played by the different sets. And therefore, this is very important, guys. We all know that one of the most important or one of the most frequent reasons for eliminating an answer choice is out of scope, right? How would you know a choice is out? Out of scope if you don't even know the scope of the conclusion so because you haven't analyzed the stimulus properly you don't know what the conclusion is you don't know what the scope of the conclusion is or at least you don't know it precisely okay and precision is so very important in CR all right guys so I'm going to be brutal today what finally happens is look at these things you'll find yourself going back and forth between the stimulus and the answer choices in this, you're wasting precious time. The time that you were trying to save when you were reading the stimulus very quickly, you actually waste here. All right. You choose uh, out of scope answers as the correct answer. Or I have heard a lot of uh, students tell me, okay, ma'am, I'm able to bring it down to the last two choices and then I choose the wrong one. Obviously, because the precision is not there. And what happens because of this? You know, you are confused. You're marking an answer because you have to mark it and you have to move forward. But the, the lack of confidence really hurts your rest of the performance. It does. Okay. So I can see uh, all these things now in your, you know, in your brains. Your, your, this is going on in your mind. Yes, my God. This is exactly what happens with me. All right. Great. So let's see. Therefore, at this time, when you are choosing the wrong answer choices, you think you're making a mistake with the choices, right? You think, oh my God, I can't decide between the choices. My dears, it's not the choice that you're making the mistake at. The mistake was made long ago when you read the passage without precise understanding, okay? That is where all the root cause of the problem lies. So here's what we, what we are going to do in today's session, not in the exact order, but these are the things that we're going to cover, which is really going to help you solve questions, even if you can't pre-think. That's what we set about to do, right? So today I'm going to discuss and demonstrate how to read the stimulus correctly. 
to draw a proper analysis of the stimulus. I'm going to use some simple examples to show you this, and then we're going to do tougher questions. Very, very important, as I've already discussed. And we teach this in our GMAT quiz course, how to read the stimulus properly, okay? How to precisely identify the conclusion, how to identify the logical gaps, and how to set the scope of the argument. This, my dears, is very, very important, very, very important, because when you cannot pre-think, if you are able to set the scope of the argument, you will be able to eliminate the incorrect answer choices in your process of elimination. And you will land with the correct answer choice. We'll come back to that. How to analyze the stimulus then? You need to identify different components of the stimulus correctly. Like what is the premise? What is the counter premise? Which of the which part of the uh, you know passage is the conclusion or the intermediate conclusion and so on and so forth? Okay, you need to identify the role played by each component. Like if you have a sentence which you believe is uh, a fact, you have to understand is that fact supposed to support your conclusion or oppose your conclusion? All right. If you have more than one conclusion, you need to understand the relationship between each of those conclusions. So you need to understand the role played by each component. That is how you can analyze the stimulus best. Okay, now we already know some possible structures of arguments. This, okay, so you might simply have a very simple argument which has a single premise and a conclusion, or you have multiple premises and conclusion, or you have a premise and the counter premise which opposes the conclusion, and so on and so forth. Various structures, okay. So, here's an example. I want you to analyze this stimulus, okay. There is no question here. You have to analyze the stimulus and tell me which part of the stimulus is the counter premise, intermediate conclusion, conclusion, premise, wherever applicable, okay? It is not necessary all four types would be there, all four of these different kinds of uh, uh, components. But you, uh, I want you to analyze this and I'll just set up a poll here. RC is reading and comprehension. Hi, Jean. I think I have pronounced your name properly, Jean. So uh, RC is reading and comprehension and SC is sentence correction. Yes, Rajdeep. Hi, Putar. Okay, Putar is from Germany. So I'm just going to bring up a poll. I want you guys to analyze this. I'm going to mute myself. So here's the poll um, to mark the correct combination. So P stands for premise. IC stands for intermediate conclusion. C stands for conclusion. P stands for premise and so on. All right. A premise is a piece of information which the author is going to use to draw a conclusion. Say, for example, um, if I say that there are dark clouds in the sky, okay, uh, therefore it is going to rain. So dark clouds in the sky, that sentence is a premise. It, it, it's, uh, it's an information or a piece of information the author is giving in order to draw the conclusion. And therefore, it is going to rain is the conclusion that the author is drawing. All right. Okay, guys. So I'm going to end the poll. If you uh, are still hesitating to put in your answer choices, please put in before I end the poll. I'm just going to count five very quickly. So five, four, three, two, and one. Now, an honest question, guys, okay? Uh, here I can see 74% of you have marked uh, the second one as the correct choice. 5% of you have marked the third uh, choice. 14% of you have gone with the fourth one and 5% of you have marked the fifth one. Now, I'll ask you a question, guys. How many of y'all really analyze the stimulus by dividing between premise, counter premise? Be very, very honest. And when I'm saying... How many of you all do this? I want, uh, I'm asking about regularly do this. How many of you all really do this all the time? You, you kind of absolutely determine what is the premise and what is the counter premise. I think you might be determining the conclusion, but whether you do it for the other components, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, I can see that a lot of you don't. Okay. Fine. Never mind. It's a very, very important step. This is a very simple stimulus, guys. I'm going to use this simple stimulus to demonstrate what you should do for even more uh, convoluted, difficult stimulus, all right? 
Yeah, Putar says he never does that. Well, that could be one reason why you are faltering. All right. So let's see how to analyze, how to understand. All right. Uh, Kelsey, I hope you understood what a premise is. So I'm going to just start with the discussion. Just pay attention. So we start reading. And reading itself here is a very, is a big art. So what we do in our GMAT with course is we start off with the sentence correction course. It is, it is, it is a must. Why? Because in sentence correction course, we teach you how to read a sentence to draw the intended meaning. You know, you break your sentence into small parts. You understand the meaning and you move forward. That is how you understand the meaning of a long sentence. So let's read here. The first sentence says, the new technologies, okay, so we're going to talk about some new technologies for the manufacture of paper. Okay, so these, this is modifying my technology. It is for manufacturing paper. New technologies require significantly, that means a lot less fuel and water. All right. So this sentence is a fact. All right. And right now, since I haven't read the rest of the passage, I don't know whether it is a counter premise or not. But I do know it is a piece of information or what we can call a premise, a fact. The author, why the author is stating this fact, we don't know. We are going to find out. On the other hand, now clearly this on the other hand, as we teach in our course, is usually a marker for another piece of fact or information or premise. But since here we are saying on the other hand, it means whatever is going to follow is going to be the opposite of this first sentence right so for now i can kind of think okay the second sentence here is going to be a counter of the first sentence let's see so on the other hand the new technologies which new technologies this okay the new technologies require a lot of labor okay so here this part is giving me some opposite information all right so for now i'm going to call it another premise all right since i don't know which of these two premise is going to support the conclusion which of these two is going to oppose the conclusion for now i am saying okay both these sentences are facts both these sentences are pieces of information about the new technologies okay one is an advantage one is a disadvantage and so here we have a connector so another piece of information this could which could so this fact which says that new technologies require a lot of labor could therefore since we have a therefore here we know that we are going to look at a conclusion offset the reduction in fuel and water cost okay so although new technologies uh, require very little fuel and water but because they require a lot of labor Therefore, the excessive requirement of labor could kind of uh, wipe out whatever water production costs, sorry, whatever cost reductions could be there because of the fuel and water cost. Okay, so this portion of the sentence is basically a counter premise so far that we can understand. All right, it is not a counter premise right away. It is a counter premise trigger the, on the other hand. So we can say that it's a counter premise, but We'll decide later on. But therefore clearly tells us it's an intermediate conclusion. Why am I thinking it's an intermediate conclusion right now? I haven't reached the end of the passage. Okay. When I read the end of the, reach the end of the passage and if I see that there is no other conclusion, this will be my conclusion. If there is some other conclusion superseding this conclusion, that conclusion will become the main conclusion. So, so far I have the conclusion that because a lot of labor is required, therefore, um, that offsets the reduction in fuel and water cost. All right. Okay. So the second premise is basically a premise for this intermediate conclusion. This counter premise is basically a premise for the intermediate conclusion. Then we have a however. It's a premise. How do we know? We're starting with since. So since like since is like saying because. Labor is cheap. Another fact. So labor is cheap compared to the costs of water and fuel. Okay, so because labor cost is cheaper compared to the cost of water and fuel, the overall costs of paper manufacture will likely reduce significantly. This is the author's final word on the entire paragraph and therefore that is the conclusion. Okay, so now if you put together the relationship, 
premise one and premise three are supporting the main conclusion. So premise one is this one, which says new technologies require less fuel and water. Premise two is this part which says labor is cheaper. These two are supporting the final message of the author that overall cost of paper manufacture will reduce significantly. On the other hand, the part which says new technologies require a lot of labor, this is going against my conclusion. All right. So that is basically the counter premise. All right. On the other hand, if you see this premise too, so th this is this is premise, uh, this, I, this one, and we are talking about this, this actually supports the intermediate conclusion. So it's a counter premise for the main conclusion, but it is a premise for the intermediate conclusion. So this kind of analysis is required. This is a very simple passage, guys. You can have a lot more twisted passages, especially for bogus questions. All right, and this is very important. Is this clear? Uh, so Kelsey, uh, Jitesh. So Aditya, the intermediate conclusion can be in favor of the final conclusion. It may not be in the favor of final conclusion, both. Here the intermediate conclusion is against the main conclusion, but that is not always so. It depends. You can have one intermediate conclusion going in the same direction of the conclusion. Wonderful. Okay, so this was a simple example. I'm going to bring forward a lot more complicated examples where I'm going to, but this is how you should read a stimulus, guys. So once you read the stimulus, it's very easy to come up with all sorts of scenarios, you know. Even if you're not pre-thinking, at least you have a, such a clarity that when you go to the answer choices, you can eliminate the ones which are not within the scope. We will talk about the scope of the conclusion also, all right? For example, in this case, the conclusion is overall cost of paper manufacture. So cost of labor might go up, okay? Cost of water and fuel might go down, but the net, net adjustment will leave the overall cost reduced significantly. Yes, Sudeep, I'll explain premise three. So premise three is basically in the middle of the last sentence, all right? If you look at this part, let me just clear a bit of this, the last sentence. So if you look at this last sentence, which starts with however, Sudeep. Now, however is a contradictory word, a transition word, okay? But if you look at since, this part is smuggled in between that however. So this portion, since labor is cheap compared to the cost of water, this is a fact. And because of this, we are saying the overall manufacturer, manufacturing cost will go down. This fact is kind of uh, helping us draw this conclusion, all right? So that third premise is kind of stuck in between uh, in a sentence, which is actually the main conclusion. Is that clear, Sudeep? So, um, yes, practicing will help, John. Sudeep, I hope that is clear. So Radha Krishnan is saying, will the counter premise counter the logic in the previous premise of, um, I would say, instead of countering the logic, it is countering the data, which is eventually going to help the main conclusion. So a counter premise is like a kind of, you know, beforehand bringing up an objection to the conclusion. All right. So let me see what other Abhishek is saying. Structure breakdown is often time consuming. So Abhishek, when you practice it, it is going to be time consuming. But once it becomes second nature to you, I, and I'm, I can say this with uh, a 200 percent guarantee through my private tutoring sessions, I have seen students really re reduce their time from a four minute to a two minute. All right. So it becomes intuitive. You can do this. It won't take you more than the analysis of the structure will not take you more than a minute, a minute, 10 seconds at the most. OK, so you you can improve upon the speed of solving only if you practice it regularly, the method. I'm going to talk about the practice also. All right, Abhishek. So I hope that answers your question also, Priyank, that how can you hope to identify this? This has to happen naturally. OK. Um, OK, so Prakhar has something wonderful to share with us. He says he started using this technique since yesterday and his comprehension and accuracy has increased somewhat in the short span of time itself. See, there you have an example. 
Akanksha says uh, method with another example. Yes, Akanksha, I'm going to use me this method in all my questions henceforth. All right, I'm going to do this repetitively and you will be able to see how this is working out. Okay. All right, guys. So this is a very, very important. This is the crux of the matter. If you're able to do this, you'll be able to solve all questions without pre-thinking. Now, for these, this question, I'm not going to give you pre, I'm not going to pre-think. We are not going to pre-think. None of us. Okay. We are going to directly read the stimulus and we are going to, uh, you solve it the way you normally solve it. I'm going to show you how, I'm going to, how, how I am going to solve it without pre-thinking. All right. So I'm going to mute myself. <clears throat> And so premise to Sudeep is a counter premise. Yes. Let me mute myself and bring up the polls. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. Okay. Seems all of you have marked in your answers. I can still see some movement on the polls. So quickly decide, guy, make up your minds. Hmm. Uh, let me answer a few questions till then. So, uh, Shaima, um, if you're unable to continue with the session because of the timing or something. So, I think if you have registered for the this webinar series, you will be able to uh, get a recording, get hold of a recording of this session in another couple of days. So, guys, we're running a, a series of webinars. This is the sixth webinar in the series and we have another um i think 14 more webinars to go every weekend at 7 p.m ist and 1 30 p.m gmt all right so let me quickly now stop the polls okay let me announce the results to you so 11 percent of you believe the answer choice is a 42 percent of you believe it's b two percent believe it's c 17 percent of you believe it's d and 25 percent of you believe it's c okay so here goes, uh, here is what I have to say, guys. Uh, you might have done this question earlier. You might not have. It's a 700 plus level question. The point is not whether you got this question correct or not. That is where people make the biggest mistake. They just see whether they've got the question correct and they think, okay, I know the, I know how to solve it. No, you have to understand. Did you follow the right process? Did you reject the incorrect choices for the right reasons? Did you select the correct answer choice for the right reason? If not, then you haven't learned anything. This question is wasted for you. You're welcome, Shaima. You're welcome, Bhavak. So let me now go ahead with my process of answer analysis. Uh, sorry, the stimulus analysis and answer choice elimination. Okay, here goes, guys. I'm going to start off with my uh, paragraph. So an economist, now that means this, the author of this entire paragraph is the economist. All right. And we, he's saying, he or she is saying something. So let's read on. Paying extra for fair trade coffee. And so here, I, we don't know whether this is a modifier or this is, this is the subject of this entire sentence. So let's just stop here and understand. There is something called fair trade coffee. And if you read a little forward ahead, coffee labeled with fair trade logo. So let's call it FT coffee for the sake of reference. Okay. So paying extra, that means uh, people probably pay extra for this fair trade coffee. Okay? So paying extra is intended to help poor farmers. So this is the actual sentence. Paying extra for FT coffee is supposed to help poor farmers. Okay, The intention is to help poor farmers. So you file that information away in your mind. Because, all right, so here is... We are going to get a premise here. All right. Because they, so they refers to the poor farmers, they receive a higher price for the fair trade coffee they grow. All right. So this is the premise. And that based on that premise, we have the information that paying extra is supposed to help poor farmers. Okay. So that uh, uh, here we get, an, we, we found, form a picture of a scenario. There is poor farmers. Okay, they are growing fair trade coffee. They get some extra money for this fair trade coffee. All right. And they are supposed to be helped by this extra payment. Okay, let's see. This practice may. Now here, the moment we come to this may, we know it's not a fact, right? It's more like an opinion. May happen, may not happen. Let's see what the opinion is. 
So whose opinion is this? The economist's opinion. The economist is saying this practice. So which practice? Paying extra to these poor farmers for fair trade coffee, however, hurt more farmers in developing nations than it helps. All right. Okay. Um, by the way, guys, let me ask you one question before I proceed further. What is the conclusion of this paragraph? Can you guys tell me? I'm going to help you, Kelsey. You can also tell me what is the main conclusion of this stimulus before we proceed further. You can you get you guys can give me your answers in the chat box. I'll give you some 10-15 seconds to type your answers. Okay, I have some answers here, so let me read them out, guys. And remember, I was telling you when we were talking about stimulus analysis that we have to have a precise understanding of the conclusion. So let's see. Lots of you have put in here. So Pranjal says, paying extra for fair trade coffee. No, Pranjal, that is not the conclusion. Are says, this practice may hurt the farmer. Um, that is also not the precise conclusion, Adi. Pratik says, fair trade coffee is not good for non-fair trade farmers. No, Pratik, that is also not the correct, the precise conclusion. Radhakrishnan is saying extra amount for fair trade coffee. No, that is not the conclusion. Peter says conclusion is fair trade coffee is not reaching its goal of actually helping the poor farmers. No, Peter, that is also not the exact conclusion. Uh, Aditya says practice hurts farmers in developing nations. Um, Aditya, you're very close, but you're still not precise. Nitin says, fair trade coffee will result in a disadvantage for non-fair trade coffee producing farmers. Again, Nitin, close but not precise. Salman says, this practice hurt more farmers. Wonderful. Very good, Salman. This practice hurts more farmers than it helps. This is the precise conclusion. It's not just about hurting farmers and not helping farmers and increased uh, price and stuff like that. The precise conclusion is, Paying extra for fair trade coffee, this practice, it may hurt more people than it actually helps. Kelsey, so Kelsey, you got it almost right. I think you didn't uh, write it out correct, fully, but that's the, that's the thought that paying extra for coffee actually hurts more farmers than it helps. Okay, that's the conclusion. So I can see a lot of you did not get it precisely right. Yes, Jean, very good. This practice may hurt more farmers. Okay, non-fair trade are at a loss is not the conclusion. The conclusion is more farmers are hurt than are helped. Okay, so again, see, Vimal, you can see the precise conclusion is not about high price, reducing profits and stuff like that. Very good, A. Um, so, Rani, fair trade coffee does not help non-fair trade farmers is again is not the conclusion. All right. Good Prakhar, Narain, counterproductive is fair trade coffee to non. Again, see, the issue is, the issue is not that non-fair trade, uh, sorry, fair trade coffee, paying extra for fair trade coffee is bad. The issue is more farmers are hurt than are helped. So the conclusion is not saying that farmers are not helped. The conclusion is not saying that the uh, farmers, all farmers are suffering. The conclusion is saying it is hurting more farmers than it is helping. So if there are 100 farmers total, this conclusion says like, you know, say 60 farmers are hurt and 40 are helped or 70 are hurt and 30 are helped or 80 are hurt um, and 20 are helped. This is what this conclusion is saying. This is the precise conclusion. All right. Uh, I, I kind of jumped the gun a bit, but this is actually the conclusion as I will explain. Okay. Hi, Solomon. Good to see you back. So, Gerard, the first is the premise. The second is the counter premise. Um, okay, uh, let me see. So, hi, Sai. So, hurts more farmers is the precise conclusion. All of you guys, okay? Let me proceed. So, this practice hurts more farmers. Hurts more farmers in developing nations than it helps. <clears throat> the circled pieces of information are the main conclusion, guys, okay? All right. Then once the conclusion, so this is a conclusion right now, if you're reading the passage, you should understand that, okay, economist believes the practice hurts more farmers than it helps. All right, let's see what further. 
by raising average prices for coffee clearly the language is telling us the author is going to explain how more farmers are hurt so by raising average price for coffee so this when you're paying extra for the fair trade coffee the average price for coffee on the whole so you have so you have fair trade coffee and you have just the uh, normal coffee let's say fair trade coffee and you have normal coffee so if you're paying extra for fair trade coffee the average price of coffee on the whole is uh increasing and that encourages more coffee to be produced so if you are a person and you want to do some farming you think okay coffee is fetching a, a, you know a lot of a uh, high price so let me start uh, farming coffee and that encourages more coffee to be produced than consumers want so consumers are not able to uh, uh, you know um, use or consume that much of coffee so obviously if you have you know uh, excess of supply over demand that is going to push down the prices so eventually this lowers the prices for non fair trade coffee and thus lowers profits for non fair trade coffee farmers so this is the technique guys this last line is not the conclusion this is not the conclusion this is the technique or the mechanism by which the practice is hurting more farmers all right okay clear so our conclusion is paying extra for fair trade coffee a practice intended to help poor farmers in developing nations may hurt more farmers than it helps so the crux is the precise conclusion is more farmers are hurt by the policy than are helped and this is what i meant you could go wrong in your prethinking just because of this imprecise conclusion guys it might sound very simple Uh, it might sound something which is not very important or significant but trust me it is all right it is it is really really important and we are not going to prethink but before we uh, move on to setting the scope of the conclusion we'll quickly look at what the question stem wants us to do to evaluate the strength okay so it's an evaluation question to evaluate the strength of the economist's argument economist's argument is basically to evaluate the strength or how strong the conclusion is it would be most helpful to know which of the following so clearly we need to know some information which is going to help us evaluate this right is this believable is this strong is this not strong okay this is what we do in an evaluate question right so the scope now this is very important guys pay attention we are going to set the scope of the argument or set the scope of the conclusion argument and conclusion is the same thing our conclusion is more farmers are hurt by the policy than are helped right we are not going to prethink we are going to tell us okay any new piece of information that shows that paying extra for fair trade coffee may hurt more farmers than it helps so any sentence in the answer choice which shows me that more farmers are hurt than our health will be my correct answer choice and i have not prethought i have just said the scope of the argument my correct answer choice will be an answer choice which will tell me more farmers are hurt than our health okay anything else is out of scope guys is this clear let me put up a poll here uh yes is this clear how to set the scope of the argument or scope of the conclusion because this you can do for any question guys any question it works and you don't even have to prethink you just have to keep as your focus this scope and any answer choice which falls out of scope is going to be incorrect all right so previously as i told you the proportion of people who chose different answer choices i'm going to do something right now guys i'm going to bring up the poll for this question again okay no let me do that for the next question so i'm quickly going to go by now i think you have realized um, what could be the right answer so let's see choice a now then now we are into the process of answer choice elimination directly we are we are not we have not done any prethinking a says whether there is a way of alleviating alleviating means uh, reducing okay so this choice is saying is there a way of reducing the impact of increased average price for coffee on non fair trade coffee farmers profits so this choice is basically not even touching the conclusion this choice is focusing on the way to decrease 
the problem for the non fair trade coffee farmers okay understand this is this choice is looking it's it's like asking is there a solution is there a solution for non fair trade coffee farmers now is that within the scope of the conclusion does this choice tell us that more farmers are hurt come on guys does this choice tell us that more farmers are hurt than are helped does this choice tell us that more farmers are hurt than are helped no right so it is out of scope okay now farah is asking a question how did i support the conclusion so the conclusion was it hurts more farmers in developing countries than it helps and the support given by the author was in the last sentence the support was because of this extra payment for fair trade coffee a series of things happen what happens more people want to grow coffee they want to take advantage of the increased fair trade uh, increased average prices of coffee but because more coffee is produced than is consumed supply increases supply increases therefore the uh, you know with the demand low the price falls because of the price falls therefore the people the non fair trade coffee farmers they do not benefit from this practice all right yes good puter is out so i can see that all of you now understand this is out of scope all right great we are going to use the same scope for all the choices you will see and we have not done any pre thinking so this is out of scope because it does not even tell us whether uh, more farmers are going to be hurt or not you know this was our scope and it is this choice is out of scope sorry i think i have marked the wrong arrow here this is out of scope okay b what proportion what proportion is like what percentage of coffee farmers in developing nations produce fair trade trade coffee all right so now this choice is talking about numbers of coffee farmers i mean not absolute numbers but let's say if we have 100 uh, coffee farmers total coffee farmers okay so this question is asking how many are fair trade and how many are non fair trade like in terms of for every 100 okay so because we wanted to understand about more farmers are hurt in terms of we were talking about numbers we can kind of delve a little deeper into this to see whether it falls within the scope or not let's see low proportion so remember whenever we are looking at the answers of evaluate questions we always always take our answers at two extremes okay one will be a yes one will be a no in this case since we are asking what proportion so one answer will be low proportion one answer will be high proportion that is how evaluate questions are done okay so low proportion so if out of 100 total coffee farmers okay let's say there are 100 total coffee farmers only five farmers are growing fair trade coffee then what happens is 95 non fair trade coffee farmers would be hurt right so more would be hurt okay and less will be helped so definitely one part of this one end of this question okay is definitely helping me evaluate that this practice may hurt more farmers than it would help let's take it to the other end high proportion so if a high proportion that means out of total coffee 100 total coffee farmers if 95 are fair trade and only 5 are non fair trade that means less will be hurt okay and more will be helped so if we knew this information we knew the proportion then this would definitely help us evaluate whether more farmers are hurt and this would be the correct choice this would fall within the scope can you see this guys can you see how this falls within the scope can you see how this falls within the scope guys yes this is the test of extreme thank you govindam absolutely we call it the test of extremes yes pooja in case of evaluate questions we have to take the choice to two extremes to see whether it works on both extremes 
it is not necessary that on uh, one extreme it is going to um, uh, strengthen and on the other it will always weaken it is also possible that on both the extremes it can strengthen that is also possible okay i can see all of your all, all of you were able to see that uh, some of you uh, let me end the poll i think i didn't put the question properly guys is this uh, scope of the conclusion clear to you how this choice falls within the scope of the conclusion great now you will see i'll use the same scope of the conclusion to eliminate the other choices no confusion anywhere so let me proceed to the other choices lot of you chose c d and e okay just 40% of you chose b let's see where we went wrong because it is very important to understand where why we went wrong okay this is very important to master the approach whether many coffee farmers so okay this is also talking about numbers so we are going to pay special attention here whether many coffee farmers in developing nations also derive income from other kinds of farming okay does this tell us that more farmers are hurt than help no so out of scope out of scope absolutely does this tell us more farmers are hurt no it just says some there might be farmers um who uh, earn from some other kind of farming not coffee so it's totally totally out of scope you can call it irrelevant also but i prefer to call it out of scope because this does not affect my conclusion at all d whether consumers should pay extra for fair trade coffee okay so this is asking what the consumers should do should they continue paying for uh, paying extra for fair trade coffee if this practice lowers profits for the non fair trade coffee farmers does this choice help us to decide more farmers are hurt guys does this choice help us decide more farmers are hurt let me ask you this question does this choice help us decide more farmers are hurt than are helped does this choice tell us more farmers are hurt than are helped it just asks us to see if consumers should continue paying or not yes can you answer in the polls no it does not therefore it is again out of scope all right 25% of you marked e as the correct answer guys one fourth of all of you and let's see where you went wrong how fair trade coffee farmers okay so we are talking about the ones who are supposed to benefit how fair trade coffee farmers in developing nations could be helped without lowering profits okay so this is this choice is asking us to come up with a method other than this practice i mean this option is asking of for, for another way of helping the fair trade coffee farmers without hurting the non fair trade coffee farmers does it help us to decide whether more farmers are hurt by the policy guys does it help us to decide whether more farmers are hurt by the policy let me again reset the poll and ask you this question does this choice tell us more farmers are hurt than are helped does this choice tell us that more farmers are hurt than are helped no it doesn't and therefore it is out of scope so those of you who mark this i hope you can see what you could have done how you could have used the scope of the conclusion to arrive at the correct answer we did not prethink at all in fact if we had prethought this is how we would have done i'll just show you quickly okay so for the passage paying extra for fair trade coffee raises the average coffee price okay average coffee total coffee fair trade and non fair trade and that attracts more coffee production more people enter coffee production more coffee is produced okay and that lowers the non fair trade coffee prices because so much of coffee cannot be consumed by people that is how this practice hurts the non fair trade coffee prices okay so here the conclusion was it lowers profits uh, sorry by this the profits are lowered for non fair trade coffee and the conclusion is more farmers are hurt by the policy how can we identify more farmers are hurt if we know how many farmers are actually growing the fair trade coffee and how many farmers are growing the non fair trade coffee so that's the gap we haven't been told how many grow fair trade and how many don't grow fair trade but we have concluded that more are hurt so logically some assumption has been made that the majority of the farmers or a very high percentage of farmers uh, grow fair trade coffee and that is why non fair trade coffee farmers are hurt 
So again here, same thing we would have done and we would have formed the evaluate question. What is the percentage of farmers going ferritate coffee or non ferritate coffee? Or what is the number of farmers either ways? So if we had done the pre-thinking, we would have done all of this. But we actually were able to do this without doing all that pre-thinking, merely by reading the stimulus, understanding the stimulus, setting the scope of the argument. How about that, guys? How did you like this? I'll just quickly put up a poll for you. If you really understood this and liked it, mark a yes. If you did not, mark a no. Non fair trade, I think that, that hurry, that is just a label given there. Okay. So, in wherever this country is, okay, they are growing two types of coffee at least. One is called a fair trade coffee, the other is called a non fair trade coffee. Simple. Yes, guys. Okay, great. So, this is for all of you out there who really find it difficult to pre think under two minutes. I personally, find it difficult to pre-think for all kinds of questions, okay? Not difficult to pre-think in terms of uh, I can't pre-think, but that if I have to do it under the exam pressure, would I always be able to pre-think? Maybe, maybe not. Would I always be able to set the scope of the conclusion? Yes, always. If I read the stimulus properly, I am going to be able to set the conclusion. In fact, we at GMAT Wiz lay a lot of stress on you being able to understand the language, whether it is for sentence correction, whether it is for CR, whether it is for RC. So Priyank, by using this scope of the conclusion, all you're doing is you're analyzing the stimulus. At the end of your analysis, you are drawing the conclusion in precise terms and you're just setting a question that this is what I need to find out about my conclusion. You've seen the process, right? I'm going to show you for the next questions also. And it doesn't take any more time. I mean, people spend 20, 30 seconds on pre-thinking. That is actually cut short. You can devote all that time to eliminating the answer choice, right? In fact, the correct approach to CR questions, guys, and this is what a GMAT Wiz student learns right from the beginning, is to analyze the stimulus correctly either pre-think or set the scope of the conclusion and for pre-thinking we have frameworks also which i'm going to discuss in the next webinar all right so stay tuned for that today i am discussing how to set the scope of the conclusion and the third step is answer choice elimination now how to analyze the stimulus is where we teach you everything from the basics all right a lot of you were asking for example kelsey was asking um, uh, how, what is the premise, all right? Everything down from the basics in the simplest terms, the entire course I have developed, you will even hear the voice is mine. So uh, the language that I'm speaking to you uh, with right now is the language I have used there, all right? Very, very simple, okay? So we teach you how to analyze the stimulus, okay? And one of the most common mistakes made during the answer choice elimination stage is set, uh, selecting out of scope answer choices. So we teach you how to understand the scope. You know, we have divided the CR questions into two genuses, two types, two categories. I'm not going to go into details about that right now. We tell you how to set the scope for category one. We teach you how to set the scope for category two. All right. And using that, uh, that method, how to set the scope, you're able to kind of avoid pre-thinking where pre-thinking is not easy or not possible. Okay, we teach you exact in very, very precise manner how the scope is defined in different kinds of questions. As you can see, I've just brought some slides from the course. So a uh, GMAT with student finds, its, uh, finds it a cakewalk to go through the stimulus, all right? I'm also going to talk in detail about how we are, how we will be able to analyze the stimulus better or how to understand that language because the language in the CR stimulus is very dense. So let me bring up the next question, guys. Let me just look at some of the questions here. So A is saying, isn't it possible for fair trade farmers to get hurt because of lower prices? So that's the question A. How many are fair trade? How many are non-fair fair trade? And the practice hurts more farmers than it helps. You heard the issue is not which farmers are hurt and which farmers are helped. It is overall more farmers are hurt and less are helped. Have you understood this? It isn't about how, whether it is possible for fair trade farmers to get hurt. That was not the conclusion. The conclusion was more farmers are helped, not more fair trade farmers are helped or more fair trade uh, non-fair trade farmers are hurt. No, it was just more farmers are helped. 
than our herd, okay? Overall farmers. Yes, Vijay, we have to frame the scope of the conclusion based, uh, scope of the conclusion based on the conclusion. I'll quickly take you back a few slides if you want to show you how the scope is set. Just quickly go back a bit so that it just iterates in your mind. See here. So pay attention. Once we have framed, so here is your scope. You can look at this. Here is your conclusion in precise terms and see how we have set the scope of the conclusion. See, any new piece of information that shows that paying extra for Patriot Coffee may hurt more farmers than it helps. So this is your scope. Any new information, that is your answer choice scope. Clear? Guys, shall we move to the next question? Let me bring up the poll and ask you this. I hope you're enjoying the session. I hope you're learning loads and loads of things. Shall we move to the next question, guys? Okay, wonderful. Here comes the next question. So let me just move forward quickly. Here it is. This is our own question. I hope you enjoy it. All right, guys, I'm going to start uh, my countdown before I end the polls. So here goes. Uh, stay tuned till the end, guys. I'm going to provide you with the PDF of this webinar so that you can go through it at leisure. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. Okay. All right. So I'm going to close the poll, end the polls. It's still moving. Okay. Seems to have settled. <clears throat> All right, so 26% of you believe the correct answer is A. 43% of you believe it's B. Clearly, uh, B has the majority because the others, uh, C has, nobody's has, nobody has chosen C. 23% uh, believe the answer is D and 6% believe it's E, okay? So majority of you have gone for B. And the next uh, majority, the next fight is between A and D. All right. Now, before I proceed further, once again, quickly, what is the precise conclusion of this argument? It's a weakened question. So definitely there is a conclusion. I want you to give me the precise conclusion um, in your own words in the chat box. That's the question, Govindam. Yes. Let's see. I'll share the PDF with you guys uh, once I end the webinar. Quickly, the conclusion, guys. In very simple words, what is the precise conclusion? So, Rasirat is saying the process shot up in 2005. Process shot up in 2005. I'm not sure what that is supposed to mean, Prasira. Pratik says efforts are successful since price has gone up. That's not the precise conclusion. Okay, let me see. Um, John says everything after the word since is the conclusion. No, that's not right, John. Abhishek, government efforts to curb poaching were a success in 2005. Wonderful, Abhishek. Absolutely. I think there's a, a, a grammatical error here. So let me correct it before we move on. This should be were because I think typo. Sorry for that. So perfect. Abhishek is correct. That's the precise conclusion that government's um, uh, uh, efforts to stop poaching. Okay. These efforts were successful in 2005. This is the conclusion. No, Radha Krishnan, the price increase is not the conclusion. Yes. Govindam, go. government efforts have been successful. Perfect. 
curb the poaching of elephant is what i suppose farah you meant that government efforts were successful that is the conclusion all right so the precise conclusion here is the first sentence that the government was successful in reducing or curtailing the hunting of elephants okay that is the exact conclusion all right so good kelsey you could that absolutely uh, sai so kelsey again government efforts to curb poaching uh, was successful is the correct uh, conclusion the conclusion is not that government efforts to curb poaching of elephants help to increase the price that's not the conclusion kelsey the okay, conclusion is the first sentence only we'll come to that how okay so sai you are correct um, again hari uh, that is not the conclusion ivory prices uh increase because producers can buy it from anywhere that is not the conclusion bijoy yes you are right so i can see a lot of you have put in correct uh, choices so rani that's not the correct uh, conclusion shruti uh, that's not the precise conclusion okay salman good once again pranjal good rasirath i understood the price but that is not the conclusion okay anubhav again there is no because here the the conclusion is not about prices the conclusion is government effort so i hope those of you who chose that, that is correct okay jean the government efforts increase the price is not the conclusion the government uh, uh, efforts were successful is the conclusion okay how i'm going to discuss that so a lot of you got that wrong and that is because you are connecting the dots where the dots uh, you are connecting the dots incorrectly okay let me show you how so bear with me let's read the first sentence government efforts okay so we are talking about some sort of efforts put in by the government to do what to curb that means to stop the poaching of elephants primarily for their ivory tusks okay so let's stop here and understand these elephants are chiefly or mainly hunted for their ivory tusk and the government efforts to stop the hunting of animals for, uh, elephants for this Uh, were a success the efforts were a success basically so we are saying government efforts were a success in 2005 now when you read this sentence on its own okay it doesn't sound like a conclusion there is no conclusion marker there is uh, this is coming right at the beginning of a paragraph uh, but that should not ever be a reason why you think that this is not the conclusion the conclusion can be the first sentence can be a middle sentence can be the last sentence anywhere anyway so when we read this sentence we are immediately not aware that it is the conclusion it is only when we read the second sentence that we realize the first sentence is the conclusion so look at the second sentence if the efforts had not been successful if the efforts had not been successful actually means what what does this mean if the efforts had not been successful it means the efforts were actually successful okay this line this part means efforts were successful if it had not been successful is another way of saying efforts were successful the price of domestically produced ivory goods would not have increased significantly in 2005 okay so efforts were successful how do we know that we know that because price of ivory goods that means goods made from ivory increased all right so these two are linked by so that if clause if conditional if i convert what it really means is the efforts were successful can be said because the price of ivory goods increase in other words if the efforts had not been successful the price would not have increased which means the efforts were successful how do we know that because the price of ivory goods increased significantly and then we have a premise here since so this is premise 1 okay uh, which says the price of domestically produced ivory goods increased premise 2 is the producers of ivory products they buy ivory from any uh, source that means here in the context it means they are also probably buying ivory from uh, poachers okay so since they buy from poachers as well therefore 
the fact that the price of ivory goods increased shows that the supply of ivory went down which itself shows that the government efforts to stop the hunting of elephants for their ivory also was successful so the second statement starting from if till country is just a premise full of premise all right and if you look at the question itself if you go back to the the question itself does not contain any other conclusion right it simply says the argument would be more seriously weakened which means the conclusion is definitely the first sentence here okay so conclusion is the government was successful in stopping the poaching of elephants the elephants were mainly hunted for the ivory tusk okay if we read the second sentence the reason behind believing that the efforts were successful is that the price of ivory goods produced within the country increased significantly in 2005 okay so the fact is also the producers buy ivory from all sources all sources would also include from the poachers so that is what we have to infer here okay again let's set the scope of the argument scope of the argument would be any new piece of information that shows that government was not successful since we have to weaken this conclusion this is the conclusion right we have to weaken this so we have to choose any new piece of information that shows that government was not successful in stopping the poaching of elephants in 2005 so any information that says this directly or indirectly will be within the scope of the argument the others will all be out of scope is this absolutely clear guys so let me just quickly answer john is asking a question very important question john can a fact be a conclusion all right isn't a conclusion supposed to be an opinion that is for or against the conclusion or something that results from the fact absolutely john i agree with you that is what i said when i read when we read the first sentence immediately we don't realize it is the conclusion okay but when we read the second statement we realize that the second statement is given to support the fact that the government was successful to show that the government has successful it had been successful if the government had not been successful x y z would not have happened that means the emphasis is on government was successful so in this case the first statement becomes a derived statement it, it becomes a statement which is being stressed upon okay all right so i hope that is clear now how to set the scope of the conclusion all right just give me a moment i'll just have some water guys Okay, that was fine. So um, let me. Okay, Prakhar, uh, these questions. This question is seven hundred plus level. Okay, somewhere around I would say seven fifty level. In fact, going you, you can see that by the kind of uh, close answer choices we've had. So Vimal is asking a question. Can it be that poaching reduced because of other reasons and not government efforts? No, Vimal, that is not the conclusion. we are not saying that the poaching reduced because of the government efforts we are saying the government's efforts were successful this is what the difference is we are not talking about a cause and effect here we are talking about the fact that something happened is true all right vimal so had the conclusion been that uh, poaching reduced because of government efforts then we would be looking at a choice which would say that poaching could reduce because of other reasons but here the conclusion is not a cause and effect the conclusion is simply a, the effect that is government efforts were successful all right vimal okay vimal um, let me clarify let me just just give me a moment let me write the two sentences okay uh poaching let look at these two sentences poaching reduced okay because 
of government effort this is statement 1 statement 2 government efforts were successful in reducing poaching look at it for a while and ask yourself are the two same guys all of you look at these two statements look at these two statements and tell me are they the same do they mean the same the first statement is a cause and effect it would become a causal argument over there you are trying to prove that the cause was government efforts but in statement 2 we are not trying to prove that government efforts were the cause behind something we are simply trying to prove government was successful let me restate my question guys are the two statements same are the two statements same are they saying the same thing no guys i think my question is wrong okay let me restate my question guys hold on don't answer the poll my question is i have written two two statements statement 1 and statement 2 are these two statements do they mean the same thing if these two are the conclusion do they mean the same thing mansi farha yes govindam so vimal do you understand now they are not the same okay now especially when we look at it from the point of view of weakening all right okay if we had to weaken the first statement then we would have to show that something else reduced uh, something uh, poaching was reduced because of something else okay if we were weakening the first statement we will kind of look for a weakener which says poaching reduced because of something else if we are weakening the second statement we will show that government was not successful in reducing the poaching is this clear vimal yes absolutely good very good analysis a first one gives credit only to government and second one just says that government was successful absolutely okay so i think uh, vimal i hope that is clear to you i didn't get a response from you but i hope that is clear okay prakhar uh, is asking a very important question he saying practicing such questions only will help me answer easier questions no prakhar it's the opposite every time you practice okay let's say if you are practicing 10 questions in cr all right um always start with three easy questions okay four medium difficulty level questions and three hard questions you will never reach the hard questions if you do not successfully uh answer uh, the easier and the moderate difficult level questions uh you are welcome vimal i'm glad it's clear clearer to you or uh, you can write down the two statements and think about it more deeply later on also okay so that is why it is very important to get the conclusion very precisely because a little bit of difficulty here and there you might choose the wrong answer okay so here goes since prices for domestic ivory goods increase now this is my thought process this is not by pre thinking this is while i was reading the paragraph i was thinking like this prices for domestic ivory goods increase that is why here they are saying the efforts to curb poaching were successful so we have to weaken the idea that efforts to curb poaching were successful now since we are talking about price here we can definitely think about demand and supply clearly because poaching of elephants if that had stopped the supply from the poachers should have reduced okay so we have we can think about demand and supply very easily here so we now this this kind of general information or common sense let's put it this way you are expected to have if you are applying for an mba uh, all right so when demand is high and the supply is fixed or is low the price is high similarly when demand is fixed or low the supply and the supply is high the price is low so here poaching of elephants for the ivory tusk if that poaches it will if if the if the poaching goes on that will add to or maintain the supply okay since the ivory producers are willing to buy from all sources so the supply would be maintained but we are saying 
and this would keep the prices from rising the author is making the connection that the supply must have reduced significantly by curbing poaching to raise the prices so clearly the supply has reduced from the poacher's side this has been assumed all right this is not given anywhere but this is assumed so a weakener would be any statement that shows that the supply in the country of i uh, country okay from poachers was reduced but not because they stopped poaching we can show that it was reduced but we can kind of show that they were they were still poaching so somehow we we need to come up with a choice which will show us that the poachers were still poaching that's the scope of our conclusion right so with that uh for example we could say that the poacher started smuggling ivory outside the country so let's see a says poacher started getting a significantly better bargain abroad for their ivory in and around 2005 now this suggests that the poachers were still poaching in and around 2005 but they were not selling the ivory in the country they were selling it outside the country so this choice would help us doubt whether government's efforts were really successful and this is the correct answer 26% uh, of you 23% of you i think got this right and i hope you got it right for the right reasons all right now a lot of you marked 43% of you i think marked for choice b we'll discuss why choice b is incorrect so just hold on just hold on okay let me now explain to you b see b is saying the demand for ivory products now this is attacking the uh, uh, conclusion from the demand perspective the demand for ivory products uh, they are giving us some special items not really very important but still the demand for ivory products suddenly shot up in 2005 so this is giving us a reason why prices increased okay demand shot up that is why prices increased does this tell us that poachers were still poaching is this within our scope guys does this tell us does this tell us that supply from ivory supply of ivory from poachers had increased or decreased does this tell us is it within our scope all of you let me uh, reset the poll and ask you does this choice tell us that poaching continued it doesn't right it tells us the demand for ivory increased uh, sorry the price increased because the demand increased not because the supply decreased so this is giving us another reason but then this the the question was not that government efforts is the only reason for uh, poaching to go down so this choice is not really giving you a clear reason or it is not telling you that government efforts to curb poaching were not successful all right so govindam last season says that producers can buy from other sources so it buy from all sources govindam so pratik this choice is telling you that the demand increased that is why the price increased this choice is not telling you that the price increased because the government efforts to curb poaching was or was not successful it doesn't even talk about poaching at all it is totally looking at a different angle we are not weakening a causal argument a causal argument this could have been a, a, a weakener that something else led to the rise of price but rise of price is not the conclusion pratik govind the rise of price is not the conclusion the conclusion is government efforts were successful okay so if we just go back a little bit okay look at the weakener we are saying government we need to prove government's efforts okay to curb poaching was a success all right so we have to prove okay we have to prove that the efforts were not successful if we just go back a little bit here hmm. we have to prove that the government efforts were not successful this is what we have to weaken so our scope is government was not successful in stopping the poaching now consider choice b does choice choice b says if i place choice b next to this okay 
चॉइस बी सेज डिमांड ऑफ गुड्स इंक्रीज ओके प्राइस इंक्रीज डज दिस टेल यू दैट गवर्नमेंट वॉज सक्सेसफुल और नॉट गाइज इट इज टेलिंग यू द प्राइस इंक्रीज बिकॉज ऑफ समथिंग एल्स बट डज इट डेफिनेटली टेल यू गवर्नमेंट वॉज नॉट सक्सेसफुल मे बी द टू थिंग्स हैपन साइमल्टेनियसली मे बी द गवर्नमेंट वॉज सक्सेसफुल ऑल्सो एंड मे बी द डिमांड ऑल्सो इंक्रीज देन डज इट वी कैन priyank this platform is too short a time to um, uh, cause answer your question a causal argument briefly means the conclusion contains a cause and effect guys let me ask you this choice b okay choice b could be true even when the government effort was successful right so let's say government's efforts were successful and demand for ivory goods increased all right does that tell us that price did not increase because government's efforts were not successful yes does choice b really tell us that the government was not successful in poach uh, curbing poaching i think i have put the question in a wrong manner wait let me reset the poll can you see why b cannot be the answer guys b could be true at the same time government's efforts could also be successful that is why b is not the answer all right okay great so i hope all your queries are answered let's move forward and that is how i arrived at the weakener that any choice which shows that the ivory from poachers was reduced this is the point here anything that tells us that ivory from poachers okay poachers uh did not stop hunting this is what this weakener actually means okay any choice which tells us poachers did not stop poaching so let's say the supply in the country of ivory from poachers was was reduced but not because they stopped poaching that is what we have to show supply reduced because prices did go up okay so i hope that answers your question um all of you let's look at the answer choices now as i said a is correct b is not correct because b could have happened read this okay this does not tell us that sup supply from poachers increased or decreased it is possible that price of demand price of ivory goods shot up okay so let's say uh, uh sorry i'll write this down so that will be clear to you let's say demand demand shot up okay let's say poaching reduced even then price will increase right so this choice does not tell us that poaching did not reduce okay and therefore b is a very ambiguous choice and it's wrong a very simple question b is not a weakener govindam i have explained just now because b does not tell us whether poaching reduced or not for sure okay so um my question to you is are all of you clear why b is wrong are you all clear why b is wrong are you all clear why b is wrong b could take place even when the government uh, government's effort was a success okay great so this is one of those really beautiful questions where you don't if you haven't understood the conclusion properly if you haven't understood the scope of the conclusion properly even your pre thinking will be wasted choice b c nobody chose choice c so i'm not going to go into this this is totally out of scope let's look at d in 2005 poachers identified a unique okay type four a unique and untraceable technique now they identified it but using this technique were they successful in poaching we don't know 
because this choice does not tell us whether the poachers continued poaching whether the poachers discontinued poaching therefore this choice is out of scope okay 26% of you marked d please understand this choice doesn't even isn't even very close it just tells you they know of a technique they came across a technique but this doesn't tell us they use that technique successfully or not the producers of ivory products are always ready to pay exorbitant prices for raw ivory since they know they can recover their money so this choice is merely adding to the given information that they are willing to buy ivory from all sources okay so the increase in price could have happened because producers were buying ivory at high prices and thus adding to their cost of production that could also be a reason for increase in price again this does not tell us uh, why the producers were buying at high prices okay so it could have been because ivory was low in supply or because sellers of ivory had hiked their prices so this choice by itself doesn't tell you that poaching reduced or not and that is your scope of conclusion poaching did not reduce we want a choice which will tell you very clearly poaching did not reduce okay so government's efforts was not successful now one very uh, okay if this is your true with this can we bring up the next question guys let me see yes if the demand goes up then the price increases but the that, that doesn't by itself mean that the poaching decreased it is possible that poaching decreased but the demand went up that is why the price increased all right a is that clear so hari this is a 750 plus level question all right great let's start with the next question here it is again a simple question but i want you guys to Uh, apart from solving this question i want you guys to point out the conclusion of this question okay go ahead all right guys i'm going to end the poll so let me start i can see a lot of you have done well on this question again the structure is very important to understand the structure it is very important to analyze the stimulus properly okay here goes my countdown 10 and 1 okay 7% of you marked a 35% of you have marked b 7% of you have marked c 14% have marked d and 35% have marked e so it's like between b and e it seems okay nitin never mind you can give me your answer that's okay yes govinda this is an official question the previous question was a gmat whiz question i personally made it in fact gmat whiz questions are all made according to the structures that are tested and therefore you will find them a very very close uh, replica of the structures that are there okay so this is an official question okay thank you vimal for your answer i'll include that in the poll all right great so let's quickly uh, what was the conclusion I, i wanted to know from you guys now what is the precise conclusion of this argument guys can you write it down in the chat box quickly Ah uh, yes, Govindam. We have to weaken the analogy. That's very nicely put. Yes, Govindam. The previous question was part of our question bank, GMAT quiz question bank. Okay, very good. So Nitin is saying the Nitin, Aditya, um, A. All of you have got that right. A E. Ah, uh, all of you, ah, uh, Salman. so salman it's not the closed stores will not stay vacant it's the location where the stores close down those locations will not stay vacant for long hari this hari that's incorrect discount stores are expected to close in 5 years is not the conclusion 
Yes, Jean, locations will not stay vacant for long is the conclusion. So I'm just quickly going to move to this because we have another question to solve. Let's read this. Although, so right at the beginning, we have an although, which means, you know, and we teach you this in our SC course, how to read a sentence properly so that you get the proper, correct, precise understanding. It's very, very important that you have a very good base for understanding the uh, your sentences. So here, right off the bat, we have although. Let's see what although. Although the discount stores in Gorville's central shopping district. Okay, so we are talking about discount stores. They are in a particular shopping district. Although these stores are expected to close within five years. As a result of competition from a spendless discount department store that just opened. Long sentence. Let me process the information. So we have um, Goreville's Central Shopping District. Okay. And we have discount stores. Okay. All right. And these discount stores will close. Why? cannot compete with big discount store. I'm going to write this as big discount store. What is this big discount store? Spendless discount department store. So we have probably, you know, the discount stores are going to close down in five years because they cannot compete with a spendless discount department store. So maybe there is this big department store which has opened there and that is why the other discount stores cannot compete with these. You know how we have normally in our day-to-day -day life, you have these big retailers because of whom the small retailers have to shut down their business. Okay, so something like that is happening here. It always makes sense to kind of draw an analogy with what you already know. So although this is going to happen, so this part is a premise. Okay. Again, in our course, we teach you that although is a premise marker, it gives you facts or information which are used to draw the conclusion. This part, those locations will not stay vacant for long in the five years. Okay. This part is the conclusion or this part is the derived portion. Okay. So although X will happen, Y will not happen. All right, so why will not happen is about a future prediction and that is clearly a conclusion. Whether it is the conclusion or not, we still have to see. Since, okay, so the moment I have since here, I know now there is going to come another premise. That means the last sentence is also a premise, which basically means the conclusion is the locations of the discount stores that are expected to close down will not stay vacant for long. The locations will not stay vacant for long. Okay. What is the reason given? There is a since there, right? Let's read that. Since the opening of call sense. Now suddenly, after reading spendless discount store, you read call sense and you are like, oh God, why is the author not talking about another store? So let's see. We have call sense. Okay. And call sense is not a discount store. It's a non-discount store. All right. Okay. So since the opening of this non-discount store, a new store has opened at the location of every store in the shopping district that closed down. Okay. So because of Colson, all right, stores closed down. This is what we can infer. Stores closed down. And in every location, Okay, every location that these closed stores were, a new store opened. So why is the author giving us this information? Probably the author is trying to say whatever happened here will also happen here. That is why the locations will not stay very oh, vacant for long. So we have to prove that the location of the discount stores that are expected to close down might stay vacant for long because we have to weaken the argument. So we have to show that the locations might stay vacant for long. That means our scope of the argument is any new piece of information that shows that the vacant lots might remain vacant. 
Guys, is this analysis absolutely clear to you? Is this analysis, stimulus analysis absolutely clear? So now the question remains, why is the author giving us the, uh, sorry. So this is what Govindam was saying at that time, that an analogy has been drawn here. On one hand, we have the discount stores and the other hand, we have the non-discount store. All right. Is this, let me ask you my question again. Is the stimulus analysis clear to all of you? If you have any questions, please ask. Is this clear to you? Is the analysis clear, guys? Colson store did not close. Because of Colson, the other stores closed down. Pranjal, my writing may have misled you. The second part says, opening of Colson's, since the opening of Colson's, a new store has opened at the location of every store in the shopping district that closed because it could not compete with Colson. So what we are saying here is, okay, we are talking about some stores closed down because they could not compete with Colson. So discount stores closed because they could not compete with spendless discount. Some stores closed because they could not compete with Colson non-discount department store. All right, Pranjal, is that clear? Okay. Pranjal, is that clear to you? Colson stores did not close down. Because of Colson, something else closed down. Okay. So we have two parallels here. We have two things happening parallelly. We have discount stores closing because of Spendless. We have some other stores closing because of Colson's. The only difference is Spendless discount store. Spendless is a discount store. And Colson is a non-discount store. So on the basis of Colson's example, the author is saying that the location uh, where the discount stores once stood will not stay vacant for long. So let's now move to, you're welcome Pranjal, let's move to, so our scope of conclusion, have all of you marked it? Vacant lots might remain vacant. This is what we have to prove, okay? So any choice which says vacant lots might remain vacant will be our answer. If it does not, it does not. Let's do a little bit of pre-thinking in this case, okay? Just let's do that. Let's look at the logical gaps. What kind of stores close down because of Colson? If you read this line, Colson is a non-discount department store. A new store has opened. What kind of store? We don't know. At the location of every store that closed down, every store that closed down, what kind of store? We don't know. So, what kind of stores closed down because of Colson? Now, think logically. Colson does not give discounts. Okay. So, highly unlikely that discount stores would have closed down because of Colson. It is quite possible that the kind of stores that closed down were also non-discount stores. Okay. And what kind of score stores do you think would have come up? It is more likely that discount stores came up instead of a non-discount store because only a discount store might be able to compete with Colson. Similarly, what kind of stores replace the stores that closed down because of Colson? Again, highly unlikely that discount stores came up because they will be able, to, uh, highly likely, sorry, that discount, discount stores came up because they would be able to sustain competition from Colson. All right. So you're thinking about what kind of store closed down because of Colson, what kind of store opened in the place so that it could compete with Colson. So clearly, a weakener would be the, to show that the stores that came up in the locations vacated by stores unable to face Colson's competition were discount stores. All right. So if the stores that came up in the location where the Colson, uh, where Colson was, if they were discount stores, fine. But in this case, discount store is closing because of discount store. Do you think another discount store will open up in that same location? Highly unlikely. Okay. 
so the gap here was we know that a discount store closed because it could not compete with another discount store what we don't know is what kind of store closed because of non discount department store or what store opened up in that place so that is the gap we don't know about that these two pieces of information are the gaps so when you are reading the stimulus properly you should notice okay they are just talking about new store what kind of new store they are just talking about every store what kind of store not clear okay so reading it by breaking the sentences into pieces if you break your sentences into pieces if you focus on those pieces you will be able to notice the logical gaps otherwise you won't let's see many customers of callsins are expected to do less shopping there all right so we are saying callsins customers will not shop at callsin they will probably shop at spendless does it tell us that does it tell us that the lots will not stay will stay vacant for long so what if callsins customers are now going to spare shop at spendless fine callsin is going to close down maybe but what about the lots that have become vacant will they remain vacant will they fill up does this choice fall in the, uh, within that scope no and therefore it is not the correct answer next increasingly the stores that have opened in the central shopping district since callsins opened have been discount stores so callsin was a non discount department store and the stores that have opened in the shopping district since callsins opened have been discount stores so discount store competing with non discount store okay but here we have discount store closing down will another discount store come up there then no so callsin is not a good example to come to the conclusion that the locations will not stay vacant for long this choice tells us that the locations might stay vacant for long because discount stores will not open in gorwell central shopping district again therefore b is correct all right is this clear guys rasidat if you can when you are reading the stimulus okay if something comes to your mind some idea comes to your mind develop it that point of time you can pre think some assumption but if you are not able to come up with immediately some idea think of the scope of the argument and stick to that so uh nitin and john i am going to explain wait give me a moment okay pay attention all right callsin no discount okay spendless discount what closed discount stores closed callsins what closed we don't know this choice is telling us discount uh, what closed down we don't know this choice is not telling us that also okay here locations vacant okay here also locations vacant so stores closed we don't know what kind of stores locations vacant this choice is telling us that this choice b is telling us that discount stores opened up in place of where there was a no discount store so a discount store opened to give competition to no discount store but spendless is a discount store already discount stores have closed will another discount store open up will another discount store open up and will another non discount store open i mean will a non discount store give competition to a discount store no right so jean and nitin is it clear jean and nitin is it clear to you and all the others is b clear 
it's simply business you know you're welcome nitin john is it clear to you nitin found it cleared his doubts so it's simple business sense i offer discounts i cannot compete with a bigger discount giver okay i don't offer discount i cannot compete with a bigger no discount giver so it's about competition between which and which all right so b was the answer there let's look at c at present the central shopping district has as many stores operating in it as it ever had does this help us does this tell us that the vacant lots are not going to remain vacant for long no how many stores are there doesn't matter because the discount stores will close within 5 years so there are 10 stores 100 stores 50 stores doesn't matter okay d says over the course of next 5 years it is expected that gorbel's population will grow at a faster rate if the population will grow at a faster rate then the locations actually might not stay vacant for long in fact this could be a strengthener all right d could be a strengthener if the population is going to grow then maybe just maybe some kind of something or the other will come up in that location so this is out maybe some restaurant will open in that location maybe some uh, 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 fitness center will open that in that location so if the population grows then locations might be occupied by something other than discount stores also so d is actually a strengthener it actually says that locations will not stay vacant for long we have to kind of prove that the locations will stay vacant for long let's see why a lot of you chose e many stores in the central shopping district sell types of merchandise that are not available at either spendless or colsons all right but whether those stores offer discount or they don't offer discount we don't know right so many could mean just one also i mean 1 2 3 so the locations the rest of the locations might still stay vacant for long so, sorry will not stay vacant for long if many stores currently sell types of merchandise and these are not the kind of stores which are going to close down right so e again no matter what these said stores they will close down irrespective of that if they are discount stores if they are discount stores okay so this choice does not tell us whether the vacated locations will be occupied very soon or will not be occupied very soon and therefore it is not the correct choice so kelsey uh, a new store is open but if you read read the last line this is where it is very important kelsey to learn to read a sentence properly i'll show you how we teach to read a sentence properly just in the next few slides i'll explain that okay see kelsey i want you to read the last two lines very carefully so discount store hari means it offers discounts that is how you will have to read it okay if i say a sports store it means it definitely sells sports goods primarily discount store is not the name of the store discount is not a capital d discount is a small d so discount store here means a type of store if i say a general store if i say a grocery store if i say a a football store if i say a fitness equipment store it is not the name of the store it is a type of store okay hari so you have to understand the information very carefully for that you should be able to read the sentence properly so kelsey if you look at the last sentence it is given a new store has opened at location of every store that closed down okay so we don't know whether the new discount store closed down that is given to us in choice b now how to master this approach guys i'm sure all of you are thinking about that question how to master this approach now how do most people review solutions usually people think that if i keep solving lots of questions i will be able to master the approach no it is very important to review the solutions and not only review the solution review the solution correctly okay most people how do they review solutions what they do is they review only the questions the solutions of the questions that they got wrong okay and sometimes they spend usually on uh, analyzing the option only analyzing the option okay let me see what this option meant and why i did not choose this or why i chose this so one they are only looking at questions they got wrong 
two they are only looking at the option analysis so this is why they never improve their score all right what you need to review is a whole solution okay the importance of reviewing solutions is you get to learn what to do and what not to do this is how if you look at this slide this is how each of our solutions is written down every stimulus is broken down into parts and parts and parts you can see quickly and when you analyze the solution like this you get to understand where your thoughts went wrong and not just for one question for each and every of those 3000 plus questions you have the same kind of analysis see the og solutions don't offer you this analysis for every question all right so you need to train yourself to see whether you are analyzing your stimulus properly or not how will you know that you will only know that if you compare it against solutions so you need to analyze the solution of questions that you get right and the questions that you get wrong and you have to review everything the stimulus analysis the pre thinking if any uh, the answer choice explanations everything that is how you are going to master the approach not just by looking at the solutions of questions that you get wrong okay so mastering the approach is very important learning it does not really help only by learning it you have to keep on improving at it all right guys let me bring up the last question this is another gmat quiz question go ahead all right guys i'm going to end the poll now so i'll just quickly start my countdown if you have your answers ready start polling putting them in 10 and 1 i can already see perhaps through the marathon that we've had so far some of you have already improved on your probably technique because i can see a lot more of you have got the answer right okay and again it is not an easy question because of the way the information is laid out so i'm going to end the poll guys i hope you have decided and put in your answers and i want you guys to hold on for the pdf i'll share with you the pdf of the session at the end of the session so this is the last question let's quickly discuss this okay let me end the poll 11% of you marked a 27% of you marked b 11% of you marked c 5% of you marked d and 44% of you marked e all right okay so let's see the field moles gather and store grains for consumption later okay so we are being told about some uh, if you already know moles are kind of uh, rat like creatures but otherwise if you don't know you just know that something called the field moles they uh, collect and they store grains for eating them later on okay all right the moles slow down their pace of gathering grains now here we are told about the speed of these moles the speed with which they collect the grains so they slow down their speed when the temperature shows signs of beginning to drop so it's not like the temperature already drop just when there are signs that the temperature is going to drop at that point itself these moles they start to slow down their speed of gathering grains okay they quicken their pace when temperatures begin to rise you know when i have this kind of this pattern of question what do i do i'll show you what i do okay i write like this this is i have put it under the pre thinking but this is what i write down right when i'm reading the stimulus i told you at the beginning remember that i kind of start the pre thinking if at all i pre think when i'm reading the stimulus itself so temperature drops then the moles slow down right this was the first sentence see slows down their pace when temperature begins to drop so i write down in short temperature drop dropping and moles slow down okay so here i have temperature and here i have moles slow down okay they quicken their pace that means they speed up when temperatures begin to rise okay so temperature rising they quicken the speed but slow down again 
when the temperature of the place where these moles thrive reaches its peak okay so temperature reaches maximum then they slow down again so can you see this this is what i do this is the kind of question where i even use shorthand so temperature drops moles slow down temperature rises moles speed up when the temperature rises to its maximum point you know we are given here reaches its peak okay when the temperature reaches its peak then the moles slow down again right good these moles have begun to quicken their pace in the current cold temperatures all right so let me go back so here we are told this is a fact now so so far we all we have just premises what these these moles do when the temperatures change these moles have begun to quicken their pace okay so right now currently the moles have begun to quicken their pace in current cold temperature so currently it's cold they have begun to quicken here we are told that if the temperature begins to drop they slow down right here they are saying and they quicken their pace when the temperatures begin to rise therefore the temperature must be about to begin to rise so when do they quicken their pace when the temperature begins to rise right so now that the uh, they are quickening their pace it must be because the temperature is going to rise that's the conclusion so conclusion is the temperature must be about to begin to rise so we need to find any new piece of information that must be true that must be a necessary condition since this was an assumption question okay for indicating that the temperature is definitely about to increase any choice which tells you te the temperature is definitely about to increase will be your uh, correct answer so let's go back to our analysis these were the three pieces of information given temperature dropping temperature rising temperature reaching maximum so then what is what about temperature reaching the minimum that is not given to us okay so we are supposed to read this carefully and notice what is given and what logically should also be given i mean high low highest so lowest should also be there it's not there correct the logical gap is what do the moles do when the temperature becomes colder or coldest so it was already cold right what if what if the moles you know they they kind of uh, uh, they start doing something when the temperature becomes even more cold when it reaches the minimum okay so clearly the author has taken for granted that they don't speed up when the temperature falls further temperature is cold even if it grows colder they are not going to speed up they are only going to uh, uh, speed up when the temperature is going to begin to rise this has been assumed all right because if they did speed up when temperatures became colder then the author cannot conclude that the temperature is going to increase all right so that was the missing piece guys clear yes this is also gmat quiz question govindam yes assumption you can say that uh, the assumption is that the moles don't uh, uh, quicken their pace when it grows colder okay when it grows cold uh, sorry coldest further cold or more cold or something like that all right okay so let's go a says moles can find grains more easily now for an assumption question you also have to remember that uh, without this without this the conclusion can't be true all right so moles do not speed up when temperature becomes coldest if they speeded up when temperature became coldest then we cannot conclude that the temperature is about to rise because they are speeding up so let's go to a the moles can find grains more easily what was our scope of conclusion our scope of conclusion is any new information that tells us the temperature must be about to rise does this choice tell us that the temperature will rise does this choice tell us that the temperature is about to rise it tells us when the moles can find grains more easily it does not tell us that the temperature is about to increase so therefore a is incorrect because it is totally out of scope 
Moles vary their pace of gathering grains with variation in temperature. This is already given, guys, isn't it? This information is given. Moles vary their pace of gathering grains with variation in temperature is given to you in the first few lines. Does this have to be true? That they do so in order to conserve energy. They could be doing it for some other reason also. Even then, my conclusion can be true. So, this is not a necessary condition. Okay, why they gather, uh, why they vary their pace could be any reason. I am concerned with the fact that, uh, you know, they vary their pace and that I already know. So this choice is total distortion of given information. This is not giving us a necessary condition, uh, which has to be true for the conclusion to be true. So B is out. The moles are at their quickest when they sense the approaching winters. Our concern is what happens when the temperatures drop further and not what happens when temperatures begin to drop. Approaching winters means it is not cold yet, but we have that the condition given that it is already cold. So we have to consider a situation when it grows even colder, further cold, not approaching winters. Okay. We also know that moles quicken pace with rising temperatures. We already know this. Thus, this choice actually goes against the premise, na? We are told that the moles are quickest when they sense the approaching winters. Beginning to drop, they slow down. Here we are said they are quickest when the temperatures are going to drop, approaching winters. So, C is quite the opposite of the premise. Let me just pop back and see what was the percentage that you guys marked. 11% had gone for A, 27% for B, very small percentage for C. Maximum had gone with E, which I think which is the correct answer. The places where these moles live experience only two seasons. Again, does it have to be true that there are only two seasons? What if there are three seasons? We can still have temperature rising and falling, isn't it? What if there are four seasons? We can still have temperatures rising and falling. So this is not a necessary condition. Totally out of scope. Does not impact our conclusion. Moles do not quicken their pace when already cold temperatures drop even further. And this is for our pre-thinking. What we did. So because... Here we have something that has to be true. The moles should not be speeding up when it becomes colder from cold. Okay, guys. I hope this is clear to all of you. So, I hope you can see how important it is to have the right technique to be able to see the solutions properly in order to you know, fine-tune in order to master your CR. You don't always have to pre-think, guys. I'm not saying don't pre-think. But you don't have to set aside some separate special pre-thinking time. The pre-thinking can happen while you're reading the stimulus, only if you're reading the stimulus properly. You've seen how important it is to get the precise conclusion. So at GMAT, uh, Viz, we teach you all of this. We make sure that you know how to read your sentence by breaking it down into small, small pieces. We make sure you know how to understand the stimulus and the structure of the argument. We make sure we teach you how to define the uh, precise conclusion. Okay. So guys, uh, any questions you have related to your preparation or anything, you can register for a free trial on the link there on that, uh, on the link given there. You can contact, write to us uh, at support at the rate gmitwiz.com. You can contact us on that um, WhatsApp number. You can also uh, register for this webinar series. You can visit our website and you can register for it. So I did not get you, Hari, your question. Uh, can you just reframe that? Temperature begin to drop era means the temperature is, let's say, for example, uh, if the current temperature is 40 degrees and now it's beginning to drop, but cold temperature drops further means the temperature is not 40 degrees. It's already at a degree which is cold. Okay. So you have to think about it like this era. We are given beginning to drop, beginning to rise, highest. Therefore, we should also have the lowest. So that is a logical gap there. You have to start thinking like this. So, uh, Hari, the CR lectures are covered over three modules. 
each of the modules would have multiple lectures. So for example, uh, the basics would contain about five to six lectures, all right? Then for each of the uh, types of questions, you'll have uh, one lecture at least. Some of the, for example, assumption family, we have multiple lectures because we cover pre-thinking frameworks a lot out there. So Govindam, you can get in touch with me via getting in touch with Piyush, all right? Um, you can um, uh, you can WhatsApp Piyush at that number to set up a call with him. Or you can visit our website and you can set up a call with Piyush on Calendly.com. It's there. The link is there. Um, so yeah, the list of all the webinars are there on the website, I believe. So Hari, if I had to count and tell you the lectures, let me just tell you there would be about at least um, around easily um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. There would be at least about around 18 lectures minimum. Yeah, I'm going to share the PDF, guys. In the meanwhile, there's a small request. Any suggestions from you would be welcome, of course. And I would re I request you to kind of or rate this session, any comments that we can do to help you further. And let me start sharing the PDF for you guys. So I'm sharing the session PDF, which you can download at your end. I hope you can see that. Um, you're welcome, Hari. Uh, Govindam, uh, the online classes will start shortly. Piyush will be able to give you a date better. So if you can kind of WhatsApp on that number, he'll be able to give you a date. So Priyank, CR theory, we have covered uh, CR in a very, how shall I say, right from the basics. So we, we build the base for you. We tell you what the premise and stuff like that. Then we teach you how to build a structure. Then we move on to how to draw inferences. Then we move to assumption and so on and so forth. You know, We build slowly because you cannot uh, read a stimulus properly unless until you know all of the how structures are made. It's like if I don't know, how a, a, a jigsaw puzzle is to be constructed, I won't be able to solve a puzzle, right? You're welcome, Jean. You're welcome, Pooja. You're welcome, Solomon. I hope you guys enjoyed the session. You learned a lot from it. I sincerely hope so. Next weekend, we'll have a session again on CR where I'm going to introduce you to the frameworks for pre-thinking. So today we concentrated on what to do if we can't pre-think, you know? What to do? Is there a way we can solve questions without pre-thinking? And in the next session, we will talk about what we can do um, for pre-thinking. What are the lines along which we can pre-think? So Priyank, we aren't doing webinars on the entire CR theory. Two webinars were scheduled for CR, one today, one the next weekend. All right. For detailed CR theory, as such as you say, you, you would have to uh, take up our online course or um, you know you can uh, take up the uh, online course or you can prepare for the online sessions take up the online sessions you're welcome Salman I'm so glad for all of you here um, I kind of get lost when I am talking to students I, I might have got overzealous so I hope you guys really uh, benefited from the session all in all So next weekend uh, for the CR webinar, we'll, uh, we'll meet again on 7, 7 o'clock Sunday. You also have a quant webinar, I believe, on Saturday. But the CR webinar will be on Sunday, 7 p.m. IST and 1.30 p.m. GMT. You're welcome, Priyank. You're welcome, A. I, I don't know your name. is not there. Okay, guys. Any questions? I'm there for a few minutes here, a couple of minutes. If you want to ask anything, please do so. Yes, Jean, definitely. You're most welcome. Uh, looking forward to uh, catching up. So Salman, the SC webinars, we have just completed the SC webinars last weekend. All right. So this series, uh, we are through with the SC webinars. Uh, what is going to come up 
as far as the verbal part is concerned is another CR webinar and then a couple of webinars on RC. So I think for the, the SC webinars, as you call it, you might join our online course, which we will be launching very soon. Um, this online course is usually made up of around 30 plus hours of tutoring. I'll be taking the verbal sessions. All right. Or you might take up the online course. You're welcome, Abhishek. Uh, I'm glad you found it helpful. I'm so very glad. That's uh, my, I try to do that all the time to kind of make sure that you guys, um, you know, you benefit at least even if the, if, if in the smallest bit you are, you benefit from it. Uh, can we have kind of notes of the concepts or books so that the concept doesn't slip through? Well, Govindam, all of these concepts are taught in the course as such. I, uh, I mean, I have not made any separate notes as such. So while you're looking at these sessions, you can make some notes. But see, this session is just a part of it. Okay, for mastering this approach, you would probably need to understand each and every aspect in depth. For example, how we define the scope of genus one questions, how we define the scope of genus two questions. I mean, you know, different questions have different kinds of scope. I have just given you samples of some. So these are these concepts are nobody teaches scope of the conclusion, although they speak about it. Uh, GMAT Wiz, at GMAT Wiz, we are the only ones who actually teach you in depth about, we literally hold your hand to show you how to solve the questions. In my experience, in my research, I have never come across anybody explaining to you how to set the scope of the argument. Not even power score does that. So I don't have any notes as such. This is totally what I have understood from my interaction with my students, the problems that they face. All right, guys, I can't see any more questions. So thank you so much for your uh, valuable uh, rating and your uh, feedback. I'm glad you like this. Uh, Govindam, whenever you face the gap in the preparation, you will have to identify what is it that you're missing out. Perhaps you're just going through the video lessons instead of kind of, you know, concentrating on what they mean and what they try to teach you. So you can make notes there. All right, guys, I don't see any more questions or queries. I would suggest, Govindam, whenever when you're going through the video lessons, man, just write down briefly what you have understood and then recheck whether you have understood correctly or not and then apply it. Uh, application is very important. All right, sometimes we learn things, but we don't use it. If we don't use it, we forget it. All right, guys, so we'll see you again next weekend. All right, good night to all of you. Happy learning till next week. Bye-bye.